Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening for Horizon's first community event of the year. It's uh, great to see so many familiar names in attendance. I can't tell you how great it is to see uh, a lot of uh, old uh, faces here, but we've also got a lot of new people in attendance tonight. And regardless if you are new or old to the Horizon community, we welcome you. And thank you for tuning in to learn what's new and improved with Horizon in 2021. Now, before we get to that, introductions are in order. I did want to mention, my name is Brian, and of course, you didn't tune in to hear me. So I'm going to pass the reins over to Mr. Carson in just a moment. But I did want to mention that I am here for any support that you need, be it with regard to this webinar or simply with your Horizon account. Feel free to give me a call, send me an email, whatever works good for you. I'm always here to provide support and assistance. Of course, the man of the hour, Mr. Alan Carson, is here to give us all the insights that we need. How are you doing tonight, Alan? I'm doing well, thanks, Brian. Fantastic, glad to have you here this evening. And uh, before I pass the reins over, sir, I'm just gonna explain how you, everyone can participate in the controls. So we've got a webinar control panel, which is gonna be on the right side of your screen, my friends, okay? Three main items that I want you to be mindful of. First, at any point in time, you can expand or minimize the controls with this orange button. Now with the control panel expanded, you have the ability to select your preferred audio method. Most people are gonna already be listening in through their computer speakers, but there is a phone call option. You can select that, you'll get a toll-free number, dial in and listen by phone if you'd like. Now questions. We encourage you to submit your questions at any time. Type them, click send, they're gonna to come to me. I'm gonna save them for the Q&A period, at which point Alan will do his best to address each and every one of them. We love to get questions, we encourage the participation, so make sure to ask, any questions that you'd like. I'd also like to mention that this is being recorded and will be available for replay on our YouTube channel this coming Friday. We're gonna be sending out a newsletter this Friday as well with a link to it, as well as links to different videos that we're gonna discuss this evening. So stay tuned for that newsletter. All right, enough of me, Mr. Carson, I'm gonna pass it over to you and uh, let's get to our presentation. We are good and just before we get started, people wanna make sure, is this Alan Carson or Neil Young? <laughs> um, I have a little issue with COVID and uh, somebody in the family who is very immune compromised, so I cannot get a haircut. So this is not my hairstyle of choice. Uh, I am uh, grinning and bearing it. So stop teasing me, Brian. Leave me alone. Okay. Um, oh, thanks to everybody for being here tonight. Uh, appreciate uh, you taking the time. Life is busy, life is hectic, so uh, this is uh, just great, and I think we've got a, a pretty good-sized uh, group tonight. So, as always, I start out saying, geez, I don't know what we're going to talk about, and this is going to be short and sweet, and then by the time I finish, I've got way too much to say. So um, I'm kind of stuck. I've got a lot of things I want to get off my chest. I got a lot of I've got a few different topics to talk about tonight. I'm going to do my best to get through them. These things all started out as kind of an hour goal. Well, if I'm going to try and get through this in 90 minutes. No promises. Um, to Brian's point, if I go too fast, if I uh, screw stuff up a little bit, we will have the, uh, the recording and so on that you can go back to. Anyway, let me start with, we do have an agenda because I'm being very grown up tonight. So we're gonna start with some 2020 highlights, things that we, uh, we built last year that you may or may not have picked up on. I'm gonna do just a little quick bit on uh, a marketing thought that I think is a simple tool that's useful. Um, and we won't spend a lot of time on that, but I did wanna touch on it. And then we'll talk a little bit about Horizon Marketer, which is, a little bit old, but also new because we've made some changes that I, I'm excited to share with you. So um, let's see if we can move to the next slide. And before we start, I just wanted to look back over my shoulder at 2020 a little bit with a little bit of nostalgia. And I went through all the, uh, the webinars we did last year and I selected half a dozen that I said, these are kind of my favorites. And they're available on the Discover Horizon YouTube channel. And Brian, can I ask you to uh, provide a link to those in the uh, in the chat, maybe? Certainly, sir. I'm going to send that to everyone. 
Uh, we just had a couple people mentioning that they're having some audio issues. It was a little surprising, the number of people. Just want to make sure everyone else is uh, having no issues, correct? If you have any audio issues, just let me know, please, and thank you. Yeah, it's no fun if you can't hear properly. Um, so, yeah, please let Brian know. Excellent. Thank you very um, much, folks. Sorry, please continue, sir. My apologies. All uh, right. Absolutely. Um, so I should also mention that all of the uh, our Discover Horizon YouTube uh, pages got tons of stuff on it, but we do have a playlist of all the webinars, so you can go there and uh, see all the monthly webinars kind of in one spot. So that is kind of my favorites last year in terms of webinars. I also wanted to go back and revisit my favorite slide from last year, and I do have one that a lot of you will have seen. Um, be honest with you, it's a message that needs to be delivered uh, tongue in cheek on a regular basis to help us uh, maintain our sanity in these times. So this is my definition of home inspection. So it's a business with illogically high liability, slim profit margins, and limited economies of scale. How great is that? It's an incredibly diverse, multidisciplined consulting service. That's absolutely true delivered under difficult in-field circumstances before a highly stressed, hostile audience with differing interests, oh yeah, in an impossibly short time frame, requiring the production of an extraordinarily detailed technical report almost instantly without benefit of research facilities or resources. If that sounds like a day in your life, that's the reality. And I want to just step back and say that I cannot think of another profession, and certainly not another profession that is in the consulting side of the world, that does the same level of work that you folks do in the time frame that you do it for anywhere close to the money that you charge for it. And so I would say the value that comes from a home inspection is so far and above the value of any other service in and around the real estate transaction and quite frankly, most other business activities in America that I wanna take my hat off to you folks. What we do is special. Okay, that rant is done. Let me change direction. I told you I had a lot of different things to talk about tonight. I wanna to give everybody a little contract uh, warning caution sign. Now, this won't apply to everybody necessarily, but some of this is not a bad reminder no matter what. So we had a very interesting decision handed down in Canada on January 21st, so uh, like a couple of weeks ago. And it was fascinating because it wasn't the trial about whether the home inspector screwed up, it was a judgment and a decision about a motion brought by the home inspector's attorney to say simply, does the limitation of liability clause apply or not? And the reason they brought the motion was if the limitation of liability clause is upheld, there's no need for a trial because the home inspector's uh, obligation was going to be an inspection fee of $425. So that was the whole substance of the decision. And so what happened was, it's a, it's a long convoluted story, but at the end of the day, the judge said, no, the limitation of liability does not apply. And it was thrown out. And it was thrown out because it was ruled to be ambiguous. And part of it, and I'm gonna preface this next part by saying, you probably know this, but courts across uh, the US and Canada don't much like limitation of liability clauses. And they look for reasons to throw them out. And this was not, a precedent in the sense that it followed another precedent case from the west coast of Canada, even though this was on the east coast. But here's what the judge determined. The limitation of liability was thrown out because it wasn't clear enough 
So the inspector said something like, we are not responsible and take no liability for any damage to the home or to the property or for injury. And what he didn't say was why. He didn't say due to my negligence, which strikes me as patently ridiculous. The clause said, hey, we're not taking any responsibility. It's going to be limited to the inspection fee no matter what happens. And the court said, but you didn't say we're not going to take any responsibility for negligence. And so for that reason, it was thrown out. That and a couple of other minor ambiguous things. There's lots of reasons these clauses get thrown out. I'm bringing this up tonight because this is a new one to me, at least in Canada. So I'm going to ask you folks to do a couple of things. First of all, you might check your contract to see if the word negligence is in there. But more importantly, if you haven't done it or haven't done it recently, I'm going to ask you to go and get a lawyer to review your contract. And I really would encourage every home inspector not to just use someone else's contract. Don't adopt it. And inside Horizon, we have a sample draft contract, but we don't want you to use it without vetting it through a lawyer because jurisdictions are different. And let me go on to say that if you're gonna have a lawyer review it, I would like it to be a very specific lawyer. I would like it to be a lawyer who has expertise in home inspection, errors and omissions cases. Ideally, it would be the lawyer who's going to defend you if you get sued. So it might be the lawyer for your errors and omissions insurance company, for example. And lastly, I wouldn't mind it if it was a lawyer who had their own E&O insurance, just in case they give you bad advice. So that's the first thing I'd like you to do. The second thing, and there were a few points that came out of the judgment that were nice reinforcements of the important things to do. There was quite a discussion around whether or not the home inspector had brought this to the client's attention early enough. And although it was a long time ago, the inspection was done in 2009, it was back in the day when inspectors typically still gave the client the contract at the beginning of the inspection, which is what happened. And now I would encourage you to get that contract into the client's hands well before the inspection as Horizon gives you the ability to do. I think that's super important. So he got away with that, but the judge wasn't thrilled that it was shown up at that time. And it was interesting because the client was a very high profile uh, Canadian personality. Uh, the, the plaintiff in the case is uh, Bubbles from Trailer Park Boys, who some of you may know. So there was a lot of argument about what happened at the beginning of the, the inspection and whether or not um, the client had enough time and had enough sophistication to understand the agreement. Lastly, there was quite a discussion around the importance of drawing the reader's attention to any exclusion clauses. And so that is pretty critical. And because I'm going to guess that most of you are not handing somebody a contract on site at the beginning of an inspection, at least I hope you're not, then I think what you want to do is make sure that in the document that you send for them to have a look at, that the beginning makes it crystal clear in all caps or something equivalent that this agreement limits the liability of the home inspector. Don't bury it in paragraph 13. Don't bury it on the backside or somewhere where it's likely to be overlooked because the courts do not like that. And as I mentioned, the courts will look for any reason that they can find to throw out the limitation of liability clause. I should also mention, and you can see on the slide, I've crossed out some states and some provinces. Those states and provinces have taken a position on limitation of liability clauses. And in some jurisdictions, they're simply not allowed. 
Alaska, California, and Wisconsin, I put question marks around because they're sort of not allowed. It, it's, a, it's a little more confusing than black and white. The ones with the lines through them, Massachusetts, British Columbia, Alberta, and Quebec, definitely you cannot have a limitation of liability clause. So this is one of the reasons you need to work with a lawyer because the jurisdictions are different. Okay, that's enough on that dreary topic. Okay, let's move on and talk about something a little more fun. And these are two, what I think are absolutely amazing, super valuable tools that we built for you last year. Okay, they're called Customize and Presets, and Presets on the recommendation side. So I'm gonna look at Customize first, and before I do, I'm gonna ask for Brian's help. Brian, can we do a little poll? I just wanna know, we built this tool, we released it last year. I'm curious to know how many folks have embraced it and adopted it. Can we put that poll up? Sure, just give me one second here, I'll launch that for you. While that's going, I will say there's a number of people appreciative to that insight about the contract and a lot of good questions that have come from that for the Q&A. So just sort of setting the plate for, for later there as this poll gets underway. I hear you, I hear you. I really hate these polls because I can't see them. I don't know why it works this way. And so I can't see the questions. I can't see what the answers are. Brian's gonna cut it off and then he's gonna tell us what the, uh, the consensus is. It's good to keep you in suspense. I forgot to add my little bonus Jeopardy music. I'll do that for the next one. But a uh, couple more seconds, folks, and we will have this completed. I really do appreciate everyone voting and participating. It makes things a lot better for us to understand where to uh, help shape the product. All right, last second here, and we will stop the poll. All right, so we had 83% uh, of the audience vote, and we have over 300 people attending so far, so we got a large variety of responses and insight. 37% uh, is, I have no clue what it is. 15%, I know what it is, but I don't use it. 21%, I've customized fewer than 10 and 28 uh, over 10. So I would say that the most of the people aren't too familiar with what it is and what it uh, can do for you, sir. All right, good stuff. Thank you for that, Brian. No problem at all, back to you. Okay, why did my screen just go funny? Hang on a second here, we'll do that, okay. Um, so let's move on and talk about this a little bit. There we go. Um, so customize is a tool that obviously maybe a quarter of the audience has played with to some extent, maybe a little bit more, but not a lot. Um, it is really designed to allow you to set up horizon so you can work faster, more easily and create even better reports. And customize is one simple word, but we've built seven elements into it. So I want to go through it. And that's why I think even the people who've played with it may not appreciate every level of it. So I do want to go through it very quickly. So there are seven deadly sins and there are seven uh, benefits to customize. So the first one is pretty simple and straightforward, although this is something people have looked for for a long time and hasn't been available. You now have the ability to not only customize your database by changing words, you can also customize the headings. And I know that people sometimes say, well, I don't like this word, we don't call it that here, we don't use this, we don't use that. So let's make sure the world's not exploding, good. Um, so if you say girder instead of beam, or you say headers instead of lentils, or water closet, or crapper instead of toilet, and it makes me wince to, think that some home inspectors say overcurrent protection devices instead of fuses or breakers, but I know some of you do. Why does it make me wince? It's, it's technically correct, it's code compliant, but most clients don't know what you're talking about. Everybody understands what a fuse is, almost no clients understand what an overcurrent protection device is. I think your reports need to be delivered to your audience in a language that the audience understands. Never mind that rant. Brian, why do you let me get off on these crazy topics that I'm not supposed to be talking about? Um, okay, so some of you call it sheetrock instead of plaster or drywall, whatever, there's, there's other names for it. Um, on the roofing side, some people call it a built-up membrane, some people call it tar and gravel, gutters or eaves troughs. You can have whatever you want now. So if Horizon makes your skin crawl because we use the wrong words, 
for your market or what your background is, just change them. So you can change the headers and you can change the item wording now. And you've always been able to add them, but we've just integrated it. So we used to use uh, My Items. We've gotten rid of that. We've moved uh, up a notch, made it all simple and integrated. So if you have thatched roofing, you want to add shredded leather as an insulation or gypsum slag, stacked plank. Here's the cruelest thing about stacked plank wall framing. Bob Dunlop and I inspected our first ever house in 1978. That was our first inspection. And we were all set to say, well, the walls are going to be wood frame or the walls are going to be masonry. We didn't know what these walls were made of and we didn't find out till the very end of the inspection and we did get a little help. It was stacked plank construction, which most of you will have probably never seen. And to be honest, we've never seen it again. It was a house in a small town out in the country, very old house. And uh, so that threw us for a loop for sure. So that was our, our introduction to our first uh, professional home inspection. Another thing you can do with this customizing your database thing, again, it makes me wince a little bit, but I know a lot of you love to do it. If you want to tick off aluminum wiring as a thing, but at the same time you want to tell the story of aluminum wiring about when it was used and how it has uh, a dramatic uh, coefficient of thermal expansion and how it's soft and hard to work with and how it's not as good a conductor of electricity as copper. You can put all that in your standard database now. You don't need to do anything fancy. And with every item in your database, you can give it a short name. So it doesn't get cut off and you wonder what the rest of it was going to say. You can give it a short name so you'll remember exactly what it is. So if you want to write a page about aluminum wiring and have that as a standard defect item, have at it. Absolutely. Not that you're going to find that happening in Carson Dunlop but you're welcome to do it. This next one I kind of like because it reminds me of Pac-Man. This is the ability to sort your database items and this is new. So in any given list of things, roofing materials, for example, whatever, you can use our sorting tool, which makes a nice little drag and drop exercise and you can move stuff around so that it's in the order that makes the most sense for you. And I think of two primary purposes for this. In a lot of cases, I like to have the most common materials first or the most common defects first so that they're easy to find quickly. And especially when you're using SpeedWrite, all those descriptions and limitations, if you put the things that you most often see at the beginning, it takes SpeedWrite and awesomely quick as it is, it makes it even faster. The other approach might be an alphabetic approach. And I find using the alphabetic listing works great for furnace names, appliance names, manufacturers, that kind of thing. Because it's not a question of what's most common. I mean, furnaces, you might have a most common furnace in your market, but we don't. We have a bunch of different ones. So you can set up different parts of your database, either based on what's the most commonly seen or alphabetic. You can also do it numerically if you're putting in the uh, the delta T on a uh, air conditioner split across the uh, evaporator coil, for example. You would probably list the numbers from small to large. So lots of different tools now to get it. And this is a set it up once, get it done, and then never think about it again, but save time on every inspection till the end of time. Okay, on to night item four. This is one that implications to me are so valuable to clients. You should always give them the, why does it matter to me? The so what explanation for all of your recommendations. And I know I've been hearing this for so many years, your implications are too scary, they're alarmist, they intimidate people. And then other people think, oh, your, your implications are too soft, they don't uh, grab the people by the shoulders and shake them enough. So I give up. I can't make any of you happy. Now you can go and fix the implications. You can create your own. You can change them. You can do whatever you want. I will tell you though, please go ahead and click that button on the report publishing side so that your implications do appear. It doesn't take any work to add them to your report. It's easy once it's set up and it's so valuable to your client. 
So it's one of the terrific things about Horizon. And up until recently, you've never had that flexibility to go in and have it your way, but now you can do it. So that I think should help. And those of you who have turned implications off, please go back and revisit it. Make them work for your clients and make them work for you. Same thing with illustrations. We took a cut at attaching illustrations to some defects, some conditions, but now you can do whatever you want. You can remove them if you don't like them. You can change them, swap them out. You can have more than one illustration for an item. And if you add a new, remember we talked about adding stuff to your database, now you can add an illustration to it as well. So you've got 1800 illustrations to choose from sitting there from the Illustrated Home built into Horizon, all part of the package, no additional cost, it's just there. Feel free to go through those illustrations and attach them. And if you're creating new items, by all means, give it an illustration. There is nothing that communicates better than the picture on your right, for example, looking at the screen. It is powerful and it is clear Somebody sent me a report yesterday from a home inspector in my town, and I looked at it, and there was not one photo, not one illustration in it, and I thought, oh my gosh, this is out of the dark ages. What is this guy thinking? Fairly well-respected firm in our town. I'm thinking, thank goodness you write your reports that way. Doesn't really impress the clients and agents. Uh, so to me, the report quality, you've got to stand out, and these tools help with that. Number six, adding links to more information. And we have this, we have this thing, we home inspectors, we really want to help our clients. And so we try to give them more than they can absorb a lot of the time. I really like the concept of being able to give them a link to a paper or an article or something that gives them more information if they need it. So they don't need to stop when they're reading the report in the throes of trying to decide whether to buy the house. But when the dust settles, they can go back and say, this guy talked about FPE panels or he talked about Kitech piping. What's the story on that? And they can click on the link you've provided them and learn about knob and tube wiring or learn about where the smoke and carbon monoxide alarms or detectors belong. And my only request would be, if you're gonna point them to some place with a link, just make it an authoritative source. Make it something, I like government stuff, I like association stuff. I don't like the fly-by-night websites. Just because it's on Google doesn't make it real. So try and give people something that they can hang their hat on. Another thing you can do with these links is provide links to partners. I think of home inspectors as building scientists, not health scientists. So I'm not smart enough to do home inspection really well and indoor air quality and asbestos and mold really well. So we work with other people to do that. And we give people the links to help them find those folks when they need them. So it doesn't disrupt from the inspection flow, but it gives people access to more information if and when they need it. Okay, on to the last one in customize. I love this one. This is the ability to have any item in your report automatically re appear in every inspection report moving forward. So we have a standard recommendation about people should have an annual roof tune-up. Why? Because it prevents leaks, it extends the life of their roof, and helps avoid complaints against Carson Dunlop. I love it. We have a thing in electrical where we say, hey, in this electrical section, please consider all of our recommendations as safety priorities because electricity is all about electric shock or fire, right? So please consider these all as priorities. On the interior section, we have a thing where we say, hey, small wall and ceiling cracks are typical of every home. So we don't beat ourselves up documenting them and so on. We just tell people, hey, they're gonna be there. And I'm pretty confident putting that in every report that people are gonna find some small cracks at some point. So those kinds, and you may have, 15 or 20 others that are better or different. I don't care, but I really love the ability to set them up and then you don't have to think about them again. They just appear in the report and make you look good, help your client and cover your butt. 
Okay, um, you're going to ask me this question, I know. But wait a minute, I use Horizon Mobile. This is all set up on the web. Does it work in Horizon Mobile? Well, of course it does. We wouldn't leave you hanging. Of course it does. When you set up Customize, the next time you do your first full sync, all of those changes migrate down to your mobile device. You're good to go. And by the way, for you multi-inspector firm people, uh, is it company-wide? Well, of course it is. You're not going to customize your database for one inspector. You're going to do it for all the inspectors. And by the way, you can control as the owner of a multi-inspector firm who gets to do the customizing. You can make it just you. You can make it your top uh, technical guy. You can share it out to as many or as few inspectors as you want. So you have your hands on the steering wheel. You're driving the bus. Okay. Let's move on. Let's talk about presets. So that was my rant on customize. Presets is a whole different thing, but the benefits are similar, taking an entirely different tack. So what are presets? Brian, can we do another poll? I want to see if this one sunk in any better than customize. Sure. It's simpler, so maybe it did. Give me a second here and let's see what we can do. Now, just while that is uh, the polls being conducted, uh, for those that are curious, as far as the tutorial aspect of it, we will be sending along on Friday our newsletter, which contains not only a recording for this, but also tutorials on how to use customized preset recommendations. We've recreated a series of new videos for basically everything that Alan's talking about this evening. So you'll have those tutorials available for you. If you'd like them in advance, just let me know, but they will be contained within that newsletter that's going to be sent out Friday afternoon. So uh, everything that he's talking about this evening you will have uh, a sort of a more of a how-to aspect from it in those videos. All right. Ryan, I thought I was being crystal clear. Why do we need videos? <laughs> well, in this case, they just need to know where to go to get started. And uh, oh. there's a couple of curiosities about how to find some illustrations. So uh, a couple of things will break oh, down. Okay. You're pretty close to clear on the how-to. All right. Yeah, I'm not a big how-to guy. You're right. Okay, how's the poll looking? Perfect. We've got 80%. We'll go ahead and close that at a minute off. Let's just share here. So again, thank you so much for your participation, folks. We're still at well over 300 people in attendance. And as you can see here, we got 82% that voted, 41%. No clue what they are. So I mean, this is going to be a, a great talk for you. 14%. I know what they are, but I don't use them. 19. I've used them for less than 10, 26%, over 10. And I know a couple power users are probably preset almost everything. Very good. Okay, so not really too different from customize on the different numbers, but same kind of order of magnitude. So that's great. All right, well, let's press on. Thank you for that, Brian. And thank you, everybody, for appreciating. It helps me understand how to kind of gear what I say moving forward to know where the, the page that you guys are on. Sorry, I shouldn't say you guys, you folks are on. Um, by the way, um, I should make it clear that I think Carson Dunlop is one of the few home inspection companies in North America with two female inspectors. And that's, uh, it's been a big topic in the news of late, at least in our community. So uh, yeah, um, and the women, by the way, are the better home inspectors than the men. So uh, go figure. All right, preset recommendations. Um, Again, the same kinds of broad goals. I'm, we're trying to save you time. We're trying to make for more consistent report output without additional work. So better quality, lower liability, and all combined with saving time. Like that to me is the holy grail of report writing. Get it better and better and faster and faster at the same time. Two goals that are usually in conflict we really try hard to get both out of it. And so let's have a closer look. So the preset concept applies to recommendations. Don't worry about it for descriptions or limitations, but when it comes to identifying a condition, you usually have to go in and tell people what to do about it, when they should do something about it, where it is. And if you're crazy enough to be like Carson Dunlop and give people ballpark cost for repairs, that too. So presets, as the name implies, allows you to take a condition and not have to fuss about the location, task, or time. You just set it up and it automatically fills out for you. How great is that? 
and it gets a little bit better because if you've got a note in there, you can preset that too. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of a rough time because I review so many reports and I see so many notes and so many of them actually repeat what's already built into Horizon. So I would ask you to be careful not to add too many notes. I know you want to be helpful. I know you want to make it crystal clear for your client, but if you've already said it, don't say it again. It, it, it makes it harder for them to read and it's distracting. But the good news is I know you're compelled to add your notes because they're genius. So I'll give you that. And so you can not only add location, task, time, and cost if you're crazy, but you can also have your notes preset. And it doesn't matter how long and rambling the note is, at least it's going to be the same note every time. Do you ever get through something and say, that's really, that's exactly how I want to say it? And sometimes you just get it right. And now you can just click a button and save it for all time. So that is super valuable. Lastly, the other part that I think is really cool is that some defects, some conditions always belong in the summary, like a worn out furnace, for example, a worn out roof. So this allows you to set that condition and have it automatically go to the summary. You don't have to remember to click the little button and you cannot sit there and all of you tell me that I am the only one in the room who has ever forgotten to add an item to the summary. If I am, you're gonna make me feel very, very stupid. So I suspect I'm not the only one and this way, none of us will ever forget to do it. So when you're setting these up, if you're unsure, have it go to the summary and then it's easy to undo if you review the report and say, oh, that doesn't really need to be in the summary on this one because it's minor. That's easier than saying what's not in the summary because you're not seeing it and saying. Whether or not use a summary, that's going to have to be for a different session and ideally over a beer that somebody else is buying, not me. But that's for another evening. So how do you do it? So here we are, we're in the notes screen. For those of you who use Horizon, this should look pretty familiar. So the defect was a uh, furnace uh, was past its life expectancy. And somebody has very wisely added a note that says, be prepared to replace the furnace at any time. My kind of example of saying what's already been said. So the location, strangely enough, is the furnace room. The task is replace the furnace. The time this inspector selected soon, he could have predict, uh, could have selected unpredictable or when necessary, there are lots of things to choose from. And by the way, you can choose your own words for time too. We give you a list, but you can create your own. Same with task, same with location. A lot of people don't know that flexibility is there. Why am I off topic, Brian? I don't know, I just, I, I kind of get distracted. So you get these things in there and then down on the bottom left, you see the add to summary button has been checked. So this is what we want to say about worn out furnaces. And so all you have to do to set the preset forever is click that little link there that says set current location, task, time, cost, summary entries as defaults. All you do is click the button. It's magic. And it remembers it, all of those items. And then once it's set, it's going to say, hey, the default text is set for this item. To remove it, just click here again. Okay, so if you change your mind, if you want to undo it, you just click the button again. What's the learning curve on that? Five seconds? You don't have to go anywhere. There's no special screen. There's no special interface. It's just in your report writing and you just click the darn button and away you go. How great is that? Okay, now you're probably sitting there thinking, but boy, this is a lot of work to go through my whole database and make these kinds of decisions for each and every one, do a lot of work. And you're absolutely right. So you know what I suggest? I suggest that you take a shortcut. And because I'm lazy, I'm really good at finding shortcuts. And so I want you to listen carefully and we'll save you a bunch of time right about now. So here's what I'd like you to do. Instead of starting with a blank report or a blank sheet of paper and figure out what you want to do for presets, just go through some old reports. Only go through your good ones though, not the bad ones. I'm sure you know which ones they are. 
And when you come across a good recommendation, just click the darn button. So you open the report writing interface, work your way through. The report's already been published, doesn't matter. You can still go in and review it. And you say, yeah, this is exactly what I wanna say about this. And as you review your old reports, if you're like most inspectors, you're gonna say, gee, I make this recommendation pretty consistently. Those ones will happen real quick. And then the others will get filled in. And so all you have to do is look at your good recommendations that you've already created with the location, the task, the time, the notes, the whether it goes to the summary or not. And you just click the button to say, hey, Horizon, remember this. Every time I do this moving forward, that's what I want to say. Pretty darn easy. Now you can go through the old reports, as I said. If you're writing reports on the fly and you get something right and you say, boy, this is the third time I've done this this month, maybe I ought to click the button. You can just take a second and a half, click the button, slows down your report writing time by about a second and a half and move on. And then you've captured it on the fly while you're writing the report and you'll never have to think about it again. So what if you've got your presets done and you're writing a report and they're not quite right for this house? Well, just change them. You can change them on the fly. It'll still remember moving forward that most of the time that's what you want to say. But if you want to edit it in the in the for that report, you just go ahead and do that. So you can change the uh, location task time, you can change the notes, you can uncheck the uh, add it to the summary. Absolutely, you can do all that for that inspection and it doesn't destroy the fact that it remembers it for the next time, but it gives you the flexibility for the report you're working on now. As you set them up, you're probably not gonna do every condition in Horizon, that's just too much, don't worry about that. But you will find, and as I review reports and I look at the Excel spreadsheet, most inspectors have a lot of repetitive recommendations that they make. Those are the ones that'll save you the most time and where you get the biggest bang for the buck. So that's where I'd focus. Okay, uh, same question about, but I use Horizon Mobile, do presets work there? Well, heck yeah, they do. Same thing, as soon as uh, you get your presets done, the next time you do a full sync, they're down there on the mobile for you. Okay, uh, company-wide or per inspector? Again, they've gotta be company-wide for them to make sense for multi-inspector firms. You don't want everybody to have different presets. That would be uh, inconsistent, wouldn't it? And again, you can control which inspectors can set up the presets and which ones can't. So the, again, you've got uh, the joystick uh, in your hands. You can control what happens. Um, yeah, the, in the summary every time, same thing, always in the summary, that consistency I think is invaluable. If there's nothing else you take out of tonight, that would be the one thing I think that would be super. And for you multi-inspector firm owners, now your inspectors don't have to try to remember you know, those long rambling emails you write about what you want them to do and why. You think they actually retain those? My inspectors don't even read them most of the time. This way, you kind of get the control without having to push a rope up a hill. It's really cool. Uh, here's the button for those of you looking to turn uh, permissions on and off. So you go into manage inspectors, you go into edit inspector data for that inspector, and it's the bottom button on the right side under other access privileges. It's checked off blue here. If you didn't want that inspector to be able to make changes to customize or to presets, you just uncheck that button, pretty simple. Okay, and all of this stuff, as we say, between Brian and Ariel, they are masters at creating videos. The support center now is so robust. It's, uh, I used to say, gosh, is everything in there? And now I'm so proud of it because I know it is so darn good. And these guys make it clear. I can ramble at a high level. These guys give you a chapter and verse in no uncertain terms. And uh, I am, uh, I'm extremely proud of the job that collectively we do for you. Okay, so let me just summarize with respect to customizing presets. Again, it's all about speed, accuracy, and consistency. There you go. Um, improve your quality, improve your business, and reduce your liability. Doesn't get much better than that. Okay. Um, we have created, and, and Brian already alluded to them, we've created some videos to walk you through this and then help you with it. And Brian already pointed you to where they're gonna be, but uh, 
yeah, they are going to be available. They're going to be in the uh, newsletter on Friday. They're going to be in the uh, reporting. Uh, you so you've got it. Use them and take advantage. It'll help you. Uh, I've kind of rambled about the benefits, but uh, these videos show you exactly uh, sort of step by step how to do it. Okay, before I go on, I did want to mention something. Um, uh, we get questions from time to time about, do these sessions qualify for continuing education credits? And the answer is it's a work in progress. And so some associations, yes, some we haven't heard from yet, so I don't quite know. And I can tell you, for example, that the Ontario Association of Home Inspectors uh, offers CE credits for these. So check with your association. Um, we are kind of going back and forth with them. We're not completely there yet uh, with some. But uh, yeah, I'm hoping that you can get some, uh, some CE credits out of this, especially given the exorbitant fee you paid for the uh, session this evening. So uh, yeah, we'll try and, and, and from our side, we'll help with certificates and anything we need to on that. And, and again, that falls to Brian and Ariel, but uh, they will take care of it. Okay, let's move forward. We've got another couple of little things that we've just launched, and I don't want to make too big a deal of this because they're not big deals, and they're to a certain extent still a work in progress, but they're out there. So the one is percent discounts. Now you've always been able to put in a line item in the horizon uh, inspection type and fee category to give a dollar discount. So you could have a $25 off discount, that's fine. But for a long time, people have wished that we could provide a percent discount, so a 10 or 15 percent discount. So we finally done that. It's available for you. And by the way, you can also do a 100 percent discount if you wanted to give away a free inspection, which I know some guys occasionally do on a marketing level, or some folks occasionally do on a marketing level. And uh, they will, in trying to win a new agent relationship, they might do a free inspection. So this gives you a great tool to do it. What I love about it is on the invoice it shows up what the full value of the inspection was, shows the discount amount, so the net is zero, but it's very transparent as to showing you uh, how much the client saved, so I like that. I'm gonna give you a little sidebar comment about discounts, and it's something that I've read a bunch and I finally tested in our business over the years and I found it to be true, especially more so recently, that I think it's true that everybody loves to get a bargain. Everybody loves to feel that they got treated uh, and, and kind of beat the system and got something special and good for them. What I have found out and concluded is the amount doesn't matter as much as we think it does. So the size of the discount, if you give somebody a discount, whether it's 10% or 15%, one is not going to make your business and the other is going to break it. A discount is, just by virtue of its name, valuable. So you don't have to give away the farm when you discount. I'll leave it at that. Okay, the other thing that we've dropped in, oh, and, and by the way, I, I can't remember, do we have videos for this, uh, Brian, as well? Yes, sir. So everything that you're talking about this evening, there is a dedicated video that we've created specifically for this. So all the updates, everything you're talking about. Um, so there are going to be all current fresh videos from 2021. And again, they'll be included on uh, Friday for everyone. Okay, because one thing I love about the percent discount thing is it is quite literally two clicks and you're done. So um, I love it. You set it up once again in your profile and then using it is just as easy as falling out of bed. It's just great. Uh, your travel fees, same thing. You get to set them up, miles or kilometers, depending what country you live in. Um, and you'll have a threshold. Hey, I charge whenever I have to go more than 60 miles or 75 miles or 100 miles or whatever it is, 100 kilometers. Everybody's different. And you, what you do is you put in just a rate. Um, 55, 60 cents is pretty common, but it can be anywhere in there. And I'm going to give you my thoughts on this tip. The tool actually calculates how far it is to the inspection and it calculates it from the office not the previous inspection you're at and i think that's an important point to just drill down into for a second the reason it calculates the distance from your office address or the company address and not the inspection that you're at is because 
if you charge a fee to go to this town on Tuesday and you're working with an agent in that town, and then a week later, you've got another inspection there, but you happen to be closer to it with your previous inspection, then there's not a travel fee. Then they go, well, why do you charge a travel fee sometimes, but not all the time? And so I think you're way better off to just do it from your base. Doesn't matter where you happen to be. Some days you're gonna be closer, some days you're gonna be further away. It's all gonna come out in the wash, but be consistent and don't surprise your clients and agents by having a travel fee to this town some days, but not others. That's frustrating to people. My other suggestion is, if you're gonna charge 55 cents uh, a mile for your travel, when you go to an inspection, I've got some bad news for you. You not only have to drive to the inspection, you also have to drive back. So what I like to do is when the horizon thing shows you that you have to go 116 miles, instead of calculating that total trip as 100, what is that then, 232 miles, I think, just put your mileage rate in as double. So if it's 55 cents that you charge per mile, you've got to go there and you've got to go back. So put it in as a dollar 10 and just put it in against the, what did I say, the, uh, the 116 miles or whatever, it is. whatever the distance is, just let it calculate against the distance. But because it's round trip, if your per mile charge is 55 cents, put in a dollar 10 because you've got to go out there and come back. So I hope that makes sense. Um, I don't like doing arithmetic. I especially don't like doing it on the fly. I especially don't like doing it when I'm talking to a client on the phone. So we tried to make it so you didn't have to think very much. So if it's less than your, you don't charge a travel fee to go to 100, go 100 miles, that's a pretty long way, 100 kilometers, maybe 60 miles, whatever, then you just ignore it. But if it's close, you push the button and the travel fee says, oh yeah, I'm over my threshold, so you're gonna charge the travel fee. So you just punch it in and away you go. Pretty simple. Okay, uh, as I say, Brian's gonna give you some videos that are gonna help you make sure that you can set that up. It takes about, uh, I don't know, somewhere between a minute and two minutes to set up each of those, by the way, if they're not a big deal. Let's move on and talk about a, a quick marketing concept that I wanted to touch on. Um, and it's called, I call it ADA and it's, a very simple tool that applies to almost all good marketing, but boy, I sure see a lot of bad marketing out there where it's not done. So whether this is something on your website, whether it's a flyer or a brochure, whether it's an email, whether it's uh, in some kind of blog or magazine or something, when you do a message trying to convince people to use your service, follow these four steps. Start out by grabbing their attention, build their interest, create some desire, and call them to action. It's dead simple, okay? Ada, A-I-D-A. And let's just give you a couple of quick examples. So it's such a simple marketing tool. So the A stands for grab their attention. And the really good ads that you see always have a title or a tagline or a lead, and they always present a problem and with that problem, they provide the solution. And that's what's attention grabbing. So how to avoid a money pit? Well, the money pit is terrible and you're gonna help them avoid it. That's the solution. Five keys to finding the right inspector. So you, by the way, that the five keys or three ways or six best, all those are good examples of ADA advertising and marketing. You see it all over the place. The professionals follow these simple guidelines. They charge a lot of money for it. You can do it for free. So five keys to finding the right home inspector. Well, I might find the wrong home inspector. What are my keys to making sure I don't? And what is my solution? So that's the way it thinks. So that's grabbing their attention. Now developing the interest is kind of, so how are you gonna follow through on your promise? Or how are you gonna drill down a little further? So did you know that 40% of homes have wet basement problems? So you really need the solution. And this is also an area where people provide the interest building benefits of free stuff. So we're gonna give you a free booklet on 
how to prepare to sell your house, a free booklet on home buying, your free home encyclopedia. Wait a minute, Horizon already includes a 500 page encyclopedia for all of the, uh, the clients. So that kind of thing develops the interest. And then the desire part is simply the benefits. That's the stay warm, safe and dry, take care of yourself and your family, live happily ever after messages. Those are the feel good results of doing the right thing and working with your company. This, by the way, is also where your reviews and testimonials go. And of course, videos are what everybody's doing now and pushing. So uh, you probably want to have a little video in there if you can manage it. But this is the, the feel good, the rewards part of the journey. So the desire. And then the one that is so simple, but is missing so many times in what I see in marketing materials. And that's the call to action. Tell me what to do next. You've got me all excited. I'm interested. Now, what do I do? Well, in home inspection, you're going to say book online now or call me now or whatever. And by the way, if you're not using Horizons online booking, please do. The price is right. It's free. And it means you're open 24 7, 365 days a year. And you can make it simpler or you can make it more detailed, whatever you like. You can get it done. We book, I forget, uh, Brian, I, I want to say about 25% of our inspections are booked online. It cuts down on the time it takes to, to spend on the phone. It's easy communication. When people book online, they always give you the right email address, right? Because they're typing it out. It's not like you have to listen to it over the phone and get it wrong 5% of the time. So there's a lot of power to that. And on the ADA, that last thing, just make sure you give someone, and I'm not a big fan of giving them three choices of what to do. I think simple is better. Ideally, one choice. Now you might have to do online or telephone because not everybody uh, likes the, uh, the, the digital world, but keep it simple as much as you can. Okay, enough on that. Let's move on. Okay, I promised you at the outset when I had an agenda about four hours ago that we would talk a little bit about Horizon Marketer, which is not new, but as I say, it is uh, a little bit different uh, just very, very recently. So Brian, I'm gonna put you to work one more time if you're still with me and you're still awake. Can you do a little poll? Because it's important to me to know for the next part of the discussion, how many people are using Horizon Marketer? Certainly, Alan. Definitely. Just give me one second here. And just like with the previous topic, a lot of uh, questions about presets, a lot of good content there. So again, we'll be sure to address that as best possible. And Phil, my good man, just with regard to the home reference book, it is a digital format. You just simply click that button and it's included each and every time in all of your reports. We do have a video on that in our help center. I'll send it to you directly as well, my friend. All right, so a couple more seconds, my friends. We'll have everyone voted. We can then uh, get back to Alan here. Oh, I'd also like to mention, hi, Peter. Hope you're doing well. Uh, Peter Wicks mentioned that for Cappy, this does give CEU credits. He's in attendance. So uh, at the very least, we've got a couple associations that have confirmed that. And if you're a member of either, you can reach out after the session for your CEU credit certification. All right, so at this point, we are good with the poll. Let me share the results. We had 83% and we're still well over 300 people listening in. So a good wealth of uh, people voting. 55%, no clue what the heck it is. 33 or 30% rather, got to learn to count. I know what it is, but I don't use it. 5%, I use one. 4%, I use less than five. And 5%, well, they use it more than five. So you uh, are in rarefied company if you use more than one, it seems. Wow. Okay. Well, this might be a bit of fun then because we talked about marketing for a couple of minutes and now I want to take it to a different level where you don't have to be a marketer to do great marketing. And this is a tool and you know what? Some of the folks on the team told me this and I have to tip my hat to them. They were right. They said, you know what, I don't think people get it. And I don't think people are using it. I think we need to change it. 
And to those folks, I'm going to say thank you because they were right based on what I've seen in the last uh, minute and a half. And so this is going to be fun. So we have made something that was super powerful and a little bit complex, now super powerful and way less complex. So since a lot of you don't know about it and aren't familiar with it, I'm just going to explain Horizon Marketer quickly. And by the way, you could call it Horizon Messenger equally well, because you're going to see that it has a number of layers to it. So in a nutshell, what is Horizon Marketer? It is a free built-in marketing and communication tool for you. It helps you run your business. It helps you build your business. Those are two different functions, and we'll look at those. It helps you communicate with your own internal inspectors, with your clients, with your agents, and even with your subcontractors. So if you do, if you outsource pool and spa inspections, for example, or indoor air quality, you can set it up so that it contacts those partners that you work with as well. It is like all things Horizon customizable, and you can customize it to meet your own internal needs and personalize it for clients and agents. And you'll see what I mean by personalized as we get into it. So I'm gonna ask you to hang with me. And there are a lot of moving parts here, but we have done, I think, an amazing job, the team in the last little while, simplifying all the moving parts and smoothing out the rough edges so you don't have to work hard to get good value. Okay, so um, the benefits, staying in touch with clients to help them remember who did their home inspection. I saw a survey not too long ago that showed a year down the road, something like 10% of uh, home buyers could remember who did their home inspection. How are they gonna refer you to friends and family and colleagues if they can't remember who the heck you are? A lot of clients are delighted with your service. I know that to be true, but the half-life of your name and your company name is probably a couple of months and then they've forgotten. Why not stay in touch and have them remember? Building agent relationships, becoming a trusted advisor, becoming a partner. You're not trying to ram something down anybody's throat. You are always trying to serve the people you work with and add value. It's as simple and as challenging as that. Providing ancillary services. We'll talk about this a little bit more. And the revenue number is highlighted here. The revenue word is highlighted here, but the solutions word really should be highlighted as well. Because I'll touch on it, but I'm going to steal my own thunder, but it's just on the front of my mind. Ancillary services are something that a lot of us offer and a lot of clients don't take us up on it. I was looking at our numbers today and about a third of our clients out of the gate get a thermal imaging inspection as part of their home inspection. And we charge about 200 bucks extra for that. By the way, don't give away your ancillary services. Thank you. Um, and what we have found and what Horizon Marketer helps with is a lot of people don't take your ancillary services because they're in a state of panic buying a house. They're not thinking clearly, they've had information overload, they've got too much stuff coming at them. And when you keep asking them to make more and more decisions when booking a home inspection, their mind goes to, I just wanted to book a home inspection, leave me alone, I'm exhausted, I'm stressed, I can't focus. But when the dust settles and they move in, two or three months after the inspection, now they didn't, now they say, well, if you tell them and explain to them what a video sewer scan can do for them, what a mold inspection or indoor air quality inspection can do for them, how it might protect their family, how a thermal imaging inspection can help them identify concealed moisture problems and mold, then at least some of them are way more receptive and they're now engaged with the house. When you booked the inspection, they hadn't quite decided whether this was their home or not. Now it's their home. 
And now if you can help them solve other problems, it's a terrific time to remind them of that. Okay. Like a lot of things we've talked about tonight, Horizon Marketer is set it and forget it. The emails go out automatically to clients, agents, to yourself, to your subcontractors. You don't have to do any work. It can happen before inspections, after inspections, whenever. You've got lots of flexibility. Let me talk about three purposes just really quickly. One thing I really like is the setting expectations aspect. So you can send out a confirmation, you can send out a reminder. And the inspection's gonna happen, just reminding you that we're on for tomorrow at nine o'clock. Reminding them to make their payment, reminding them to accept their contract terms, both of which we expect our clients to do before the inspection. The second function is appreciation, just saying thank you. Thank you for choosing us, thank you for paying us, thank you for signing the contract, saying thank you for completing our survey and giving us a Google review. Saying thank you might be old fashioned, but it is never the wrong thing to do. Marketing. We talked about the ancillary services a little bit. Here's one that I think is an interesting one, annual inspection updates. Um, my good friend, Jack Huntress at Homebinder calls them annual property reviews, and he has put a lot of time and energy into it. Things like recall check, reminding the client to watch for their recall check report and remind them of the benefit. Crystal clear and dead simple to you, but it's all new to them. So an email reminding them that that recall check is gonna tell them about anything that might have a recall, not only now, but if the recall comes three years later, they'll still get notified. How cool is that? Most of your clients don't know that, or even if they understood it for 10 seconds, they don't remember it. The value of Homebinder, if you offer your clients Homebinder, send them an email or more than one to remind them to take advantage of the powerful tool. Asking for a feedback, asking for reviews, Google reviews, Yelp, whatever you do. Um, it's just so easy to automate that process and have it happen while you sleep. It's just terrifically valuable. So what we've done is instead of asking you to build these things, we took a stab and said, what the heck, we're gonna give you a starter kit. We're gonna give you 16 emails that I think will apply to all of you most of the time. I think they're pretty safe, they're pretty mainstream, they're pretty vanilla, but I wanna get you comfortable with the tool so you can then get creative with it. So here's how simple it is. If you're new to Horizon, when you set up your account, they're all sitting there and all you have to do is flip an on off switch. That's how simple it is. For those existing Horizon users who haven't been using it, and I think we have a lot of those tonight, um, you just have to select them and turn them on. There is no work to do. It's the whole process is, I don't know, 60 seconds maybe, 90 seconds, not very long. And let's just, have a little bit of a closer look. So we created one simple template. We're not trying to be all things to all people. Remember that these are communication tools to clients and agents you're already working with. So this is not a, uh, a cold call out of the blue kind of email. This is from somebody that they've already worked with or know about. So it's low key, it's professional and it's helpful. It's not in your face. So the 16 emails we've talked about, as a starter, you can tweak them to suit. For example, uh, we sign off by saying sincerely. Well, if your style is to say best regards or something different, you can change that, not a big deal. You can change the wording to suit. You can add as many of these as you like. The price is the same, no matter how many Horizon marketers, how, how many Horizon marketing emails you create, the price is still $0 doesn't matter, okay? And again, we're here to help. So Brian, Ariel, and the team, they can help you get going. Our tutorials and so on are terrific, but I know some of you like to just have a conversation. So the magic of all this is it sends the right email to the right people at the right time, every time. And of course, it includes your company logo, 
Of course, it includes your company info and the unsubscribe button at the bottom to comply with all the laws because you have to be careful with email. You have to be careful with email in a bunch of different ways, but especially making sure you comply with the CAN Spam Act. You also have to be careful with emails in terms of not confusing and overwhelming your readers. By the way, a lot of you probably don't know that in the Horizon work order, there's a button called do not contact. So if you have a client that you don't want to pester and reach out to and bother, um, we had a very high profile client a couple of weeks ago and uh, I spoke to him on the phone on the weekend and he was very sensitive about not wanting his name released uh, because he didn't want to be seen for a whole bunch of reasons to be doing anything in the public eye. And so do not contact for people like that. People who have complained or are unhappy about your service, you might not want to send them a bunch of reminder stuff. So the do not contact button is there on the work order. If you press do not contact, Horizon Marketer respects that. And so even though you've got all these emails to set up to go out automatically, it won't go out if you don't want it to go out. So that is cool. How does it work? In the background, it checks, and it actually I think it's every seven to 10 minutes to see if there are any emails that are scheduled to send. And so it's sending them out all the time. And so it just checks and checks and sends whenever you need to have it go. And when we set them up, and this is where it gets complicated, but we've made it simple for you. There are several elements to each email that you can control, but because we've given you this starter kit, you don't have to control them. You don't have to fuss with it. So I'm gonna go through what the elements are to show you the flexibility and the power but you don't need to roll up your sleeves and dig in, okay? We're kind of trying to make it, it is, I want to show you what is involved, but I don't want to overwhelm you. So kind of take a deep breath, don't sweat the details and kind of just listen and be receptive. So the elements include a first very simple thing, every email that you set up should have a name for your internal use, so you name it so you can keep track and remember what it was. Now, the next thing is an event trigger. And the trigger is something happens in Horizon that causes this email to be triggered. It might be the contract getting signed, the inspection getting paid, the report being completed. A trigger might be before an inspection or after an inspection. Then the next thing is a series of settings immediately after the event. So if the inspection gets booked, you might want to send out something immediately. If you want to send out a reminder before the inspection, you might want to send it out two hours before, you might want to send it out 24 hours before. If you want to send a helpful email after people get settled into the house, you might want to set it at two or three months. If you want to remind them of a 12 month annual inspection update, you might want to send it at 11 months. You get the idea. So these times can be either before or after the inspection, but that gives you the flexibility. The inspection type, so you can send an email to all inspection types no matter what, or you can just send them to certain types. So, and even if it's just a radon inspection or a thermal imaging inspection or a pool and spa inspection, you can set it up so that certain emails only go to certain inspection types. So it gives you that level of control. Now you can also decide whether you want the email to come from the company or from you as the inspector. And the same with the email address that they see. It could either be the company's email address or the inspector's email address. And think about people replying or asking follow-on questions as you set that up. And we again have made default decisions for you on all these things on the 16 emails so you don't have to sweat them. You can change them if you want, but you don't have to. Now the two email, who does the two go to? Well, it can go to client one, client two, it can go to all your clients. It can go to the buyer's agent, it can go to the seller's agent, it can go to the home inspector or one of your home inspectors if you're a multi-inspector firm. And as I mentioned earlier, it can go to third party people that you work with. The subject line, I think this is the most important one because this is what drives people to either open an email that they see or skip by it or delete it. So I like to include words like your home inspection. So now 
as they read that subject line in the they wake up in the morning and they've got 27 emails and they say oh this one's about my home inspection and when it says at 27 maple avenue which is their address then they go oh this is to me by somebody i know and so it's personalized and so that is a huge driver in getting people to open and read the emails because you're communicating with them one on one you're mentioning your name their name you're explaining who you are and you're reminding them in the subject line it's about their home inspection at the address that they either live at or they're about to buy okay sorry i just need a little drink so of these emails, I'm gonna break it down because we've got some that are going to the inspector internally, some that are going to the client, and some that are going to the agent. So let's just take a quick look at each of them. Let's start with the email inspectors. Sorry, the e emails to inspectors. Um, strange, I haven't even been drinking yet. Um, so the first one is the report is ready to sink. So if you're like a lot of people, you might have a partner or a spouse or someone booking the inspections, answering the phones and so on. You might be out in the field and you can get a notice sent automatically that, hey, you've got a report ready to sync, put on your mobile device, you've got a new work order, be ready for that. Don't head back home because you've got a job to do. So you can get that. And again, the person in the office doesn't have to remember to do it. It happens automatically. Work order got canceled, the same thing. You're out in the field, you're about to head back to the office to find out you've got another job, or you're about to head to another job and the work order got canceled. So if an inspection gets canceled, it can send you an email to warn you of that. So you get up early in the morning because you've got to make a long trip. The client canceled it during the evening. Now you don't need to go on that long trip for nothing. So it's just a belt and suspenders way to make sure you're not wasting your time. Another one that goes to the inspectors is an email bounce back. Now we've always had a notification tool on the homepage of Horizon so that if a client doesn't get a confirmation email or an agent doesn't get the confirmation email or they don't get the report delivery email, which is kind of important, then the Horizon homepage always had a banner notice telling you but what we have realized is not every home inspector spends all day on the home page so what we have built is an email that when a client or an agent doesn't get an email that horizon sent them you get notification of it so you can pick up the phone and call them and say hey we tried to send you your report uh the email bounced back do i have your email wrong how did i screw this up just let the horizon marketer email take care of you accept the contract so you know that the progress is moving forward more importantly perhaps you can get an email that says hey it's only 12 hours before the inspection and the client hasn't signed the contract yet i need to know that because i should probably reach out do I have an inspection tomorrow at nine o'clock or not? So it can tell you that proactively. And it, it's fascinating to me how Horizon is smart enough. I can see easily how it tells you when stuff happens, but somehow magically it's smart enough also to tell you when stuff doesn't happen. I don't quite have my head around how that works, but it works. So that's pretty cool. By the same token, it tells you if the client hasn't paid. So you get a notification of that. You don't need to go in and look up accounts receivable. Hey, if you're like Carson Dunlop and you want to get paid before the inspection each and every time, it's now close to the inspection time and I haven't been paid yet. I want to know so I can take action. And it can be for a multi-inspector firm, that notification can go to you, the inspector, or it can go to your administrative team too, to your customer service team, and they can take care of all. Now let's move on and look at client emails. And one of the, the default ones that I think is, we get a lot of feedback from this email, by the way, positive from both clients and agents. And it is simply a reminder. So they booked the inspection three days ago. 
we send them a reminder before the inspection saying just confirming that we're all set for nine o'clock at uh, 36 uh, Elm Grove. And we give them the time and the date and the address again, just so there's no miscommunication. It used to just ruin my day when you show up for an inspection and nobody else was there because there was confusion, a communication gap on the, the time or the date or we're still the address. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So this prevents all of that. And this can go out. I've got this part of the discussion as being a client email. This should also be an agent email to me. So it can go out. These emails can go out to multiple parties. It can remind the inspector, it can remind the client, and it can remind the agent. And it can go out a day before, two days before, or an hour before, or two hours before. You get the power of that. And again, you don't have to do anything. It just does it for you. And then sometimes it prompts a call, say, oh my gosh, I can't make it. I forgot to call you. Can we change the time? It doesn't happen too often, but occasionally it does. And then everybody's grateful that the email went out. So you can send a client a reminder to sign the contract. The way we frame it is, um, as soon as you sign the contract, that will enable us to confirm the inspection for tomorrow. So the inspection is not confirmed until, until they accept the terms. And the same with payment. So it reminds them to process their payment. We don't say pay us, we say, please process your payment so that we can confirm the inspection and be ready for tomorrow. You can word it however you like, by the way. We do it our way, you can do it yours. <clears throat> Still on the client emails, a report follow-up. Just thanks for working with us, wanted to touch base, make sure you received the report, understood the report, anything I can do to help, let me know. A twist on that is the thank you and review email that thanks them for working with you, hopes that they're getting settled in nicely to their new house, and asks them for a Google review, something like that. Those of you who lose, you let me try that again slowly. Those of you who use Listen360 probably don't want to use this email because you've already asked them for a review using Listen360. Okay, let's look at the agent emails real quick. Same kind of idea all the way through. Uh, we send them uh, a quick thank you. And uh, if you send the agents the report, you can say, make sure, just wanted to make sure you got the report. Hope it all made sense. Uh, I hope that we met your client's expectations and yours. And then again, offer to help if they need uh, any assistance with questions or additional information. Uh, we have one of those for buyer agents and a different one for seller agents. Um, and then the same idea on the thank you and a referral request. Uh, we'd love to work with you uh, on your next transaction. And uh, again, one for the buyer, one for the seller. And then one on action list. And I'm going to bet not everybody on the call knows what action list is. So I'll describe it in a sentence or two, and maybe it'll be a topic for another session. Action list is a tool that allows buyer agents and buyers to create a list of things they want the seller to either fix or adjust the price on. And it's not the report and they don't have to extract things from the report. It's a super quick and easy way for them to create a list based on the report, but extracted from the report. So in a heartbeat, they can get this off to them. So this email gives them a link to the action list for that inspection. And I think it also gives them a link to a short video explaining them how to use it. Um, and we have some inspectors who say their business has absolutely grown simply as a result of Action List and how much time it saves the agents putting together the list of things for the offer addendums going back and forth when they want to negotiate. Based on the results of the inspection, we want to ask for this adjustment or that. This just makes it all so much easier for them. Okay, let's just review a little bit and ask some of the questions or answer some of the questions that I think you're gonna ask. Can you change the emails? Of course you can. Can you make every email different and each one have its own elements? Certainly you can do that. Can you add new ones? Yeah, we already talked about that for sure. Okay, now we talked about the starter kit. And now I'm gonna ask you to kind of put on your slightly more creative hat and say, what else could I be doing? And so I'm just gonna list some, we haven't built these for you, 
uh, happy to work with you, um, but I'm keen to see how many folks are interested in what. So if you do a radon test, here's one that you can do. If you do a two-day radon test, for example, you can have Horizon Marketer send a note out to you, your inspector, or your radon guy, reminding them to pick up the monitor two days after it was placed. So that's kind of nice. The recall check thing we kind of talked about, remind them of the benefits of recall check and tell them to watch for the report. Remind them to use their home binder because it's so powerful. If you offer a warranty, especially if you sell a warranty, after people get settled in and maybe they have one unexpected expense, a really good time to talk about warranty. Home security. I know a lot of home inspectors are involved in helping people get up with home security. If you do that, you can talk about that in a Horizon Marketer email. Asking for referrals, we talked about that. You can also offer a reward for referrals, and I know a lot of inspectors do that. So if a client refers them to somebody else, they'll send the client a thank you, maybe a Starbucks card or something like that. I'm not so sure I'd do that with agents, just depending on the rules that agents work by now and giving an agent a gift can cause a problem. So it may be an ethical issue for you, it might be an ethical issue for an agent, so I'm not sure I would do that, um, at least without some serious consideration. But in terms of clients, I think that would be just fine. Um, what about reaching out to real estate agents after a successful inspection and offering them a continuing education presentation for their office? You might be able to give them CE credits for it. You might even be able to charge for these things. A lot of home inspectors build their business around these realtor presentations, especially the educational ones. I'm not talking about promo where you go in and pound your chest and say how terrific you are. Agents don't care about that. Agents care about getting value, and I think you guys can provide it. You folks can provide it. We talked about the ancillary services at the outset, and if you can solve more problems for the clients after they get settled in, I think that's a win-win all the way around. And the fact of doing it after the inspection, it's likely to be received very differently than it was when you talked about it setting up the original inspection. It's just a different state of mind and a different place these people are in. We talked a little bit about the one year and two year update inspections and it'd be interesting to see how these take off. They're starting to get some traction and you can now offer them automatically without ever having to think about them again, sending out an email 11 months after the inspection and 23 months after the inspection reminding them it's time for their follow-up inspection. Here's another one that applies sadly to our current state of the world. You can send your COVID protocol to clients and agents before your inspection as a separate email. That might be a sensible thing to do. I'm not gonna tell you what you should do. What I'm trying to do with these last few items is get you thinking about the world of possibilities. And again, these are not daunting, they're not difficult. We're here to help you set them up. If you bring us the concept, we will A, tell you if you can execute on it and B, we'll do it for you or help you do it. Okay, here's another one and I kind of like this one because I talked earlier about staying in touch with your clients and agents. So you can do articles, you can do do-it-yourself videos. Uh, we have a did you know series of about a hundred little pieces that are really short 30 second knowledge bits with lots of visuals. You can give them home maintenance tips. And let me just give you a little bit on the do it yourself video thing. How am I doing for time? Oh, look at me, Brian. I'm coming up to the end and I'm coming up to an hour and a half. How good is that? So um, I wanted to talk about a little thing that you can do for clients and agents that I kind of like and we do it. Um, they're one minute videos and they're all about home maintenance. And I'm gonna tell you that I've got uh, five kids who are millennials. They don't know which end of a hammer you put the screw into. They are just, it's not for them. But when they buy a house, all of a sudden, dad, can you help with this? Can you help with that? And so these things are just ideal. So first of all, they're one minute videos, but they're customized. So they've got your name and logo on it. Your name is mentioned throughout and your name is at the end on logo. They're high quality, professionally done. 
1080 uh, pixel high definition videos. You can buy them in groups of 10 videos for 750 bucks. So they're about 75 bucks each. And they have uh, packages, I think there's 50 or 60 uh, videos all told. There's the company, Green Sky Media, uh, very solid people. Uh, Chris Thornberry is the contact there. And I just wanted to show you a sample of what one of them looks like. This is where I get scary with technology and we'll see if I can make this work. Okay, if I do this and then I do that and then I do this. Welcome to our first installment of Fun Household Tricks. In this series, we show you quick tricks for making home maintenance and organization easy. When painting, wrap a rubber band around the can. Wipe the brush against the rubber band to keep the sides of the can clean. Instead of throwing away old toilet paper and paper towel rolls, use them to keep wrapping paper from unrolling. To keep extension cords from unplugging during use, tie a simple loose knot. Finally, use a clothespin to hold small nails while hammering. Your fingers will appreciate it. To view more home maintenance videos, visit our website at carsondunlop.com. Okay, you get the idea. Whoops, did I lose did I lose the video, Brian? Uh it switched to your connected screen now, so you just gotta switch back now, sir. Okay, I thought I did that. Uh let me see if I can do this. There you go. There we go. Good. Rocking and rolling. Good. Okay, good stuff. That was a scary little adventure for me, but that kind of worked. So that's what that, and they're, they're so trivial and so simple, but they're perfect for new homeowners, right? They're just uh, absolutely mindless. So there's a link there. You can go and look at them all. There's a whole bunch, um, as we say, 50 or 60 of them. And uh, you can buy them and they'll cut, you send them your logo and so on and all your information. They'll do them up for you and away you go. So that is, I think, and it's the kind of thing you can put these into your horizon marketer video. So you could send out one a month, for example, to past clients. You could send out one a month to agents. A great way to stay in touch, provide a little bit of value, and not overwhelm people. I really like the concept. I'm going to address something that's a little bit dicey here tonight because people often ask me this question. And I, it's something I don't hardly ever think about. And then people ask me, and I, I'm kind of embarrassed that they're asking the question. So I just wanted to make it clear that we've talked about all these Horizon features we've built and improvements and stuff. For the, that is all included in the Horizon cost. There's no additional fee for that. It's kind of like the webinar. The webinar, there's no fee for the webinar. And people say to me, well, you mentioned these videos to me. What, what's your cut on that? There is no cut for us. I'm doing this because I think you should do it because we do it and I think it's good value for it. So I'm not looking for a bit of revenue from Green Sky Media. That's not the purpose of it at all. And it, it always makes me a little bit uncomfortable when people ask me the question. So I just wanted to be proactive. And then lastly, I wanted to say, just wait till you see what we're coming up with next. So we're working on some stuff. Uh, I'm hoping 2021 is going to be a, a really fun year. So let me just wind up by saying the Horizon Marketer thing is super powerful. I would really love it if you just take it out for a test drive, give it a spin, see if it works for you. It, it was a big commitment to build it. And I take my hat off to the team for making it so much easier to use just over the last, I've uh, been working on it for a month or so. So it is, I think, way more user friendly than it ever was. It's as powerful as it ever was. Um, why the heck not? Brian, I'm gonna suggest that, I'm gonna suggest two things. One is that we probably wanna take questions if anybody's still around, um, happy to do that. And I did want to mention that our next session is probably Wednesday, March 17th, a little over a month from now. And the topic remains a mystery because there's a certain lack of consensus in the Carson Dunlop organization about what it should be. So we will figure it out. Uh, we'll have an arm wrestle or something, and uh, we will uh, we'll let you know in due course. We do try and give you a decent warning about what these things are going to be. So, Brian, uh, 
it's with a certain amount of trepidation that I ask, do we have any questions? Well, we certainly do. Now, before we get to that, actually, speaking of your last point, I have snuck one last poll in there. Dun, dun, dun. What? what? I know. So, folks, we do appreciate the participation, the community involvement, and we would love to understand what we could do better to help uh, shape these community events, right? So what are you interested in learning more about? And that way we can uh, get your perspective. And when we have our round robin tomorrow, we can see what uh, is important. Oh, we've got a lot of people wanting to hear more about your report writing theory and tips. Interesting, interesting, a lot of good stuff. All right, well, we're not gonna actually share the results of this poll because it's going to be something for us to kind of contemplate. And uh, I guess we'll demystify things for you when we launch or send out the newsletter on Friday, which is in two days from now. Uh, to do my math, quick, quick math, right, folks? Um, all right, another five seconds, and then we'll close this poll, and then we're going to get to Q&A. All right, thank you so much, everyone, for voting on that poll. I'm going to share the results internally afterward. I do appreciate that, but I think everyone knows that they just want to hear about you talking about writing reports. So a lot of good stuff to come. But, uh, let's get to some Q&A. Okay, so just to let everyone know, I'm going to try to do my best to, to weed out some of the more technical how-to questions. As again, we are going to be sending videos that go into the nitty-gritty, the nuts and bolts of the mechanics of things this Friday. They're also on our YouTube channel in case you want to get a head start. So I'm going to try to get the more theory questions for Alan at this point, and then we'll address the other ones as they come along. Okay. So we're getting into, uh, this is going to go back to the contract point initially, sir. And uh, Tara has a question. Contract, wouldn't our ENO insurance provider have incentive for us to have a good uh, contract? Would it be good for them to review it? So this is going back to your original statement about getting the contract reviewed and such, sir. Absolutely. And um, yeah, I have reached out to uh, some of the ENO carriers. Some of them are really good about it, some not so much. But I, I think if you don't hear from them, I think you reach out to them and say, I'd love to have you folks review my contract. And it's not so much the underwriters that you want to have review it. And it's not even the adjusters so much. And it's definitely not the brokers and it's definitely not the salespeople, but you would really like to get it into the hands of the lawyer because it's the lawyer for the E&O insurer who will be handling the defense if something comes up. And I've seen way too many cases where the lawyer says, well, this contract doesn't do X, Y, or Z. So how can it be any good? I can't work with this. I can't. And you immediately lose the momentum and you lose a lot of the benefit of the insurance if your own team is throwing you under the bus. So that's what we're trying to provide. So Tara, that's a great point. That's exactly who you want to review it. So start with your E&O carrier, but try and drill down through the E&O. Don't settle for something superficial if they hand you off a one pager i'd really rather either unless the one pager comes from the lawyer and says here's what it is that's the source that you'd like to get to thank you alan and before we go further questions scott brought up a good point march 17th happens to be saint patrick's day and uh have an irish blood myself i don't know if we're going to be doing it that day alan but <laughs> we may be re uh, we may be rescheduling that so thank you scott for that insight Oh, wait a minute. I really like it if the audience is drinking. <laughs> well, I'm going to moderate it. successfully. We'll see on that. But thank you so much for that, Scott. Appreciate that little insight. And Tara, great question. Um, this is now, uh, you mentioned, and this is maybe just a little bit of a, a funny a cap and stance. Uh, Daryl mentioned, you know, his clause for limit of liability is 13. And just lucky number 13, I had a stroke of luck, you happen to mention, don't put it as 13. Now, is it just because that's typically a footnote in the contract or, you know, why would that be important not to have it near the, the, the end or, or it, you happen to call the exact number out? So, Well, and it's because it's 13 in our contract as well. And I was trying to make that point and I was trying to say, don't bury it, but it's okay if it's number 13 under a couple of circumstances. One is if at the beginning, you put in a sentence in all bold, maybe a paragraph by itself that really stands out that says, this contract includes a clause that limits your liability. Please read 
the entire document carefully or words to that effect. And again, I'm not a lawyer, so don't use my words. But one of the reasons that it sometimes fits very nicely as item 13 is that that is close to the end and it's typically in view when people are signing. And it's typically, if your number 13 is the one I suspect it is, it's probably in all caps and probably stands out from the rest of the text in the agreement. And it's close to the end because it was highlighted at the beginning. It's visible at the end by nature of being close to the signature and by the all caps font. That's my thought. Thank you, Alan. Jim would like to know, actually, he's got two questions. First, um, with regard to the contract, instead of Horizon, are we going to be doing any changes to the default verbiage because of this update, or is it something that our stock is going to stay? Again, the advice is to go speak to your uh, specific lawyer. Yeah, the default, no, our default language actually does contain the words that caused the problem for the home inspector in this decision. But our default wording does not work in 50 states, 10 provinces, and three territories. It just doesn't. So I almost wish we didn't have a default one in there, but everybody wants one. So think of it as something that you can take to a lawyer and say, how would you fix this? And we do have a service in the states. Um, offered by a lawyer named Joe Deneler and a gentleman by the name of David Goldstein. And they will provide, and we've negotiated a preferred price for you. They will review your contract and make sure it is suitable to your state. And if you go on the Carson Dunlop website and go in Horizon, you'll, you'll see it there. Um, so inspectioncontracts.com, I think it's called. But let the professionals do it. They they are in the home inspection protection business, those guys. I am trying to find a Canadian equivalent. Uh, I've reached out to a couple, but I haven't found the right the right fit yet to provide this service for Horizon users in Canada. So I have a partial solution, but not a full solution, which is why I didn't mention it in the uh, in the discussion. But yeah, please please don't count on the default Horizon contract being the right one for you. Thank you, sir. And I know that you've already stressed that it's always best to be vetted by a lawyer, but we do also have the one that has no limit of liability. Could that potentially be a more viable one for people to use as an interim? Again, we put it in there because people have asked for it. Because as I mentioned in the presentation, there are certain jurisdictions that do not allow a limitation clause. So we've simply put the same default agreement in there and take, taken that out. But again, same comment, please don't take it to the bank. Thank you. Jim would also like to know, is it possible to use your definition of a home inspection on his website crediting you, of course? Sure. Now, you want to be careful doing that. You, you absolutely are welcome to do it. And, and, and I, I appreciate the, uh, the sentiment. The reason you might want to be careful doing that is who visits your website and what are they going to think about that? So you may have already given that some thought and arrived at a very good solution. I just don't want your clients and agents to feel that you are a whiny home inspector feeling underpaid, overworked, and underappreciated. So it really was intended to be an inside the community document. Uh, I know some other inspectors have asked me if they can put it up on their office walls in, a, in poster size format in the reception area, and I, I know some have done that. So you're welcome to do whatever you like. I, I just don't want you to uh, to burn a bridge along the way. No, fantastic. Thank you, Alan. Um, Jeff brings up a really good question. And this actually goes back now. We've sort of gotten into the preset element here, or actually not even presets at this point. It could tie to presets to an extent, but more to the like customize. And we're talking about implications, right? Okay. So it's great that we can change them. I admit, I love it. That's cool with flexibility. But it's not always one size fits all, just like home inspection, right? So what in a situation where like we obviously don't want to go edit the implications on the fly, right? Going to customize each and every time. So how would you suggest that? Is it better like we disable the implication for that scenario and write a note to override it? Or how is it better situated so when that implication is not suitable, that's what what's the best, you know, best practice at that point, sir? 
That is a very insightful question, and thank you for that. Um, I would, and, and I'm going to paraphrase the question to make sure I understood it, and then I'm going to answer it as though the way I, I took the question. Sometimes the implications vary depending on the situation in the house, even though it's the same condition, the implications can differ. For those conditions, I would not put in an implication and I might give myself some notes and I might, uh, you know, that, that you can edit um, on the fly or write as generic a note as possible that will work most of the time with the understanding that it doesn't always work. So to, to be safer, you could leave everything out. But again, I can think of different scenarios where you might take a slightly different approach. But I think the point's well taken. Sometimes the implications are simply not going to be applicable and it's easier not to have them in there. Thank you. Andy would like to know, you're referencing a Carson Dunlop protocol earlier about talking about specifically the electrical system, right? All electrical recommendations are considered significant and should be warranted as such. Now, just for clarity's sake, this is a statement or an item you've created and put in like the recommendation overview or general category, and it doesn't automatically make those recommendations appear on the summary. That's still a byproduct of presets or the inspector's discretion, correct, sir? That is correct. Fantastic. By the way, those typically do not appear in the summary. They would typically appear only in, for example, the electrical section. So I wouldn't put that in the summary uh, because they're drawing your attention specifically to any electrical defects. And one of the ways that you can trip yourself up is if you put that in to automatically appear in every report, and if you put it to the summary, and if you have no electrical recommendations, it's gonna look very odd. So you've gotta be a little bit careful with those ones that appear all the time, because every now and again, they don't fit. The roof one, for example, does not work if you're doing a high rise condo unit because there's no roof. So a little bit of common sense and I'm going to I'm going to tell you all something you don't want to hear and that is you really need to proofread your reports. And everybody says they do it and everybody being human is like me and we all take shortcuts. And they're what you guys do in creating these reports so quickly and they're so thorough and so professional is absolutely remarkable. But I think we all begrudge the time we spend doing it and the effort it takes. And it makes that proofreading really difficult, especially at the end of the day, especially if it's been a long one. And I understand and appreciate that. But I have, and, and we have done, as you can tell from my conversation tonight, we really do try to help make it easy for you and help Horizon do everything. But some stuff, it's, it's just, we live in a complicated world. You, you really have to proofread because for all the wisdom and all the shortcuts, um, it's not gonna be 100% right 100% of the time. Fantastic. Uh, Jeff would like to know, this is talking about presets now and sort of the flexibility of it. So we were, you gave the example of the obsolete furnace, right? Now, and you use the furnace room and of course, where's the furnace room? Well, it's the furnace room. Right, so it's really ambiguous in that sense, but maybe we weren't comfortable with giving that type of uh, location, right? We, it's more situational. Is it okay if we omit that, leave that out of the preset, right? We don't have to preset everything, right? So I could have the, the task and the time or the cost estimate, and then in that situation, I simply fill in that missing criteria, right, for that given inspection. Would that be the premise, sir? That is 100% correct, and I apologize for not making that clear. I actually meant to make that comment. The location is probably the one that you often do not want to include. So if, if you've got rotted windows, for example, they could be anywhere in the house if part of the roof needs to be replaced. So sometimes if it's, if it's a whole roof, you might want to put in throughout as the location, but it's not always throughout. So location is the one that I would be careful with putting in as a default because the furnace room is an easy one but sometimes the furnace is in the garage. So um, it doesn't always fit. And uh, yeah, it might be safer to leave it out for a whole bunch of the conditions. Fantastic, oh, tongue tie there, fantastic. I mean, well, two thirds of a recommendation done with a single click is still better than none, right? So the more- Plus the notes, week. plus the summary, four yeah. things. Four things. Yeah, so in that situation, you've got it, yeah, tons.
Ruth would like to know, why only two female inspectors at Carson Dunlop? Because we just hire all the ones that apply. Fair enough. So, Ruth, you're looking for a job. <laughs> uh, fantastic question, though. And I mean, uh, it's great to see a, a lot more uh, females joining the industry, right? And especially in the training sessions that I have. So it's it's great to see the the industry evolving. Um, Absolutely. It, it, it's, it's well past uh, time for that to happen. Peter would like to know, and, and this may not pertain to what we've talked about this evening, but I just, again, because we've sort of uncovered that a lot of these features haven't really been explored too much. Is there the ability to bold things in Horizon? I think maybe a report designer would allow that capability. Is that true or not, Alan? Yeah, and that's another that's another thing we've built that hasn't been well understood and well used. Um, in a nutshell, if you use the standard classic Horizon PDF, the answer is no, you cannot bold things. However, we have a facility in Horizon called Report Designer that at a high level works like this. You put your report through its normal process, and then when you get to the report publishing page, you can take it offline, put it into a Word document, where you can do whatever you want to it in terms of bold colors, watermarks. Uh, you can make it as ugly as you want and then put it back up into the system and publish it as a PDF. So report designer makes your report output infinitely flexible. There are pros and cons and complexities a little bit, so I don't want to make it, uh, I don't want to over promise and under deliver, but report designer is phenomenally powerful it probably could do with a little bit of the attention that we've just given to Horizon Marketer, which is to um, pull back some of the flexibility and improve the user friendliness and simplicity of it. But yeah, to Brian's point, Report Designer can do that in a heartbeat and so much more. Thank you, Alan. Now, uh, Terry would like to know, just clarify, with Horizon Marketer, this is sort of uh, an, an event triggered, situation specific emailing client or messenger it's not a mass emailing service where you can retroactively email perhaps past inspections or maybe mass email out all of your clients and agents saying i have a new promotion or something of that nature there's a distinction between its capabilities and what it's designed to do is that correct sir that is exactly correct and that's something else i should have mentioned during the, the session this is not a replacement for mailchimp or constant contact or the mass email uh tools that are out there and they're inexpensive and they're broadly available. This is targeted, individual, customized, client, agent, and inspector specific emails. It is not a mass email marketing tool. If you wanna send an email out to all your agents, then you should use MailChimp or one of the other half dozen products that are out there that work very well for that. So thank you again for a very important question to distinguish between those two. Thank you. And I just want to add to Alan's point, there is the data export option within Horizon that allows you to export all of your agents or clients in case you wanted to send out a mass email with just a couple clicks. It's super slick. Get an Excel document, pop it into your mass emailing client, and you know the rest is uh, rest writes itself, really. Um, now, just because I'd like to hear your answer on this, Alan, how much, again, does Horizon Marketer and these updates cost for our users? You don't got to pay nothing. Best answer is a free answer. All right, thank you. All right, we're getting close to the end of our question, surprisingly. We've got a lot of great ones. We're gonna couple up. So I would say, folks, we're gonna try to address about seven more minutes worth of questions. That will allow us to finish up at a, a nice timely 10 p.m. Um, we are going to be evaluating what we're gonna be doing for next month, perhaps the date and or subject, but we will let you know on Friday. So please stay tuned for all of those updates. But uh, let's get through a couple more questions here. Um, Bear with me one sec as I'm scrolling down through. My apologies. Okay. Uh, Timothy would like to know, is the intention for you to somewhat compete with ISN as far as Horizon Marketer and the emailing capabilities in parallels? Or what was the you know, sort of intention with the updates there? Um, I must confess, I don't know much about what ISN is doing on that front. So uh, you're giving me too much credit for saying that I'm competing with them. 
Um, no, Horizon Marketer has been around for a while and it, it wasn't me, it was my team. Uh, and we get called upon to customize things from time to time in Horizon Marketer. But in fairness, it was uh, Ariel, it was Brian, it was John, it was Dave who said, we're not seeing a lot of activity. I would have thought we would see a lot more. And so we did uh, drill down a little bit and it looked to us like there wasn't the level of activity that I would have expected. And you, and you folks, and thank you for this, you've confirmed that tonight, that we didn't quite, and I mean, I take responsibility for this. We, we put this stuff out and we do kind of one notice and we hope that everybody drops everything that they're doing and focus on nothing but for the next week. Well, that's not real world. And so we need to do a much better job of communicating. And it was really part of the genesis for these webinars was that we all felt that we had built such an amazing thing and people didn't see it, couldn't feel it, couldn't touch it, couldn't use it, couldn't enjoy it and couldn't leverage it. And so, I mean, I think you can tell that I love to do these because it gives me a chance to, to share the work. Not that I've done, I, 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 I haven't built any of this. This is it's kind of a, a group thing. I have some concepts, but the people who execute, the people who bring this to life, they're the ones who are being underserved. And our clients in much the same way are being underserved because we have not done a good enough job of communicating the capabilities of Horizon. So that that's my responsibility. Thank you so much, Rowan. That's great. Um, now, this is, again, going to probably be in sort of partially in vain to what we're talking about, just by wide uh, spectrum at this point. Any general advice for just new inspectors in the industry helping get a foothold in today's, you know, COVID times with uh, maybe getting traction with an agent, um, any sort of final thoughts on that, which, cause it ties in a lot with marketing, with, you know, developing yourself, any closing thoughts on, on, on that by chance? Well, yeah, I mean, we could talk about that for a long time and, and how do I touch on something in two or three minutes? Um, and I'm not even sure I have that. Um, first of all, I, I understand the challenge. And, and I recognize and appreciate the challenge. And especially given these crazy COVID times, uh, our hands are tied in lots of ways that they've never been tied before. So we might need to be a little bit patient and get some vaccines out there and get people back to whatever the new normal is going to be. But it's got to be better than where we are. Um, in terms of, of marketing and getting yourself out there, just in a nutshell, a couple of things. Don't market by telling the world how great you are, market by bringing value. Um, I really like the ADA principle of solving a problem for people. There's a whole concept called story brand that I'd love to talk to you about sometime that for new people mark. Focus everything on the client or the agent rather than the uh, home inspector. And so, it's it's storytelling. And by the way, I, I think the best marketing is really done as a story and a story with value to the listeners or to the readers or to the web viewers. So I would focus on um, trying to bring value, trying to solve problems. You don't have to look around too far to see the problems people are having. Um, including in the real estate community, uh, lots of houses selling, but lots of realtors not doing too well. Um, so there is that. And then there are some really silly things. Uh, people talk about unique selling propositions. To find a way to differentiate yourself, I think is valuable. To find a way to stand out from the crowd. Um, and again, I don't like gimmicks and I don't like, uh, kind of loud, brazen stuff, but that's just my style. Some people do very well with it. I know a home inspector who's incredibly successful, who um, dresses the part to be memorable and it works very well for him. So there are lots of great ways to do that. Um, yeah, let me, let me leave it at that. It's, 
I, I wish I had a glib, well, if I had a glib quick answer, everybody would be using it and you'd be no further ahead, right? So that wouldn't help all that much. But um, yeah, I, I think uh, a bit of persistence. The last thought I might give you is that most people, clients and agents, cannot evaluate the quality of your work because they don't understand home inspection well enough. It's like, I can't evaluate the work of the mechanic who works on my car at the garage. In fact, I may not even see him a lot of the time. What people can evaluate is how you make them feel and what your customer service is like. And I think my father had a saying that still remains true. And that is showing up on time, doing exactly what you said you would do when you said you would do it, puts you ahead of the pack. And so the common courtesies and the appreciation and the grace and the just the good manners that the world seems to be losing, I think can be a differentiator for people. And we get, we have, I don't know, 4,000, 5,000 testimonials on our website. If you wanna have an interesting read as to what people care about, go look at our reviews and testimonials. There are almost none about the quality of the work. It's all about showed up on time, act professional, listened to my questions, offered to help, went beyond, things that people can evaluate, not things that are the technical nitty gritty nuts and bolts. We do get some a lot of positive comments on our reports, but it's how clear they are, how easy they are to read. So those kinds of things matter. There's a whole talk about uh, I don't know if you ever heard that there's there's a whole famous thing about coffee stains. And the point of the thing is, what do airline passengers care about? And when you get on a plane, which none of us are doing very much anymore, nobody can evaluate the condition of the engines or the controls or the wings or any parts of the mechanical part of the plane. But when you sit down and you pull down that tray table and there's a big coffee stain on the tray table from the person who sat there before you, that colors your impression of the whole airline. If they don't even care about these tray tables, how do they care about the engines? And what kind of condition is the cockpit in? And it's that you can be guilty by association from the simplistic things you do, or you can be elevated by it. And I think, I mean, how many of you are frustrated dealing with businesses every day because people don't respond or don't respond promptly. People don't show up on time. People don't do what they said they were gonna do. Would it be fair to say that's rampant in the world these days? It is in my world. And so making a concerted effort to show up, by the way, you may have heard the phrase Lombardi time. Vince Lombardi was a coach of the Green Bay Packers in the 60s. You'll all be too young to remember that. But Lombardi time meant wherever you were going to be, you needed to be 15 minutes early to be on time. If you weren't 15 minutes early, you were late on Lombardi time. And I think that's true in home inspections. You do not want to be showing up to an inspection with the client and agent standing in the driveway, tapping their foot waiting for you. You're off to a bad start to begin with. So I'm already, I said two or three minutes, I've talked for five, I'll shut up. I, I care passionately about this. I'd love to help you more. I don't have a silver bullet, I'm sorry. There's nothing to be sorry about, sir. Everyone appreciates your candidness and insight. It takes uh, it means a lot to everyone. I'm sure that I'm uh, I can resoundly say that for everyone in attendance. You know, at this point in time, we have just uh, passed the ten o'clock mark, and I think that this is a perfect time to cap off. Friendly reminder, folks, that we will be sending the follow-up email this Friday with links to a replay for this, as well as dedicated tutorials for everything that Alan has talked about, so you can watch those and or just simply give myself a call. I'm here today, tomorrow, well, not tonight, but tomorrow, Friday. I'll be glad to help you out with anything you may need outside of the uh, tutorials that we'll present to you. Thank you so much for your participation. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for the engagement. Most of all, thank you for being a Horizon member. It's a community, and uh, it's great to see so many people in attendance because during lockdown, I'm looking at four walls. <laughs> Alan, any final remarks? Or final remarks? I just wanted to say thank you. Troopers.
Love you, everybody. Brian's kind of the together on all that, and uh, he handles all the tough stuff and uh, and makes it easy for me. So I appreciate it. Um, I love doing this to death, and uh, look forward to uh, seeing you next time. Have a good evening, everyone. Thanks, choosing Horizon.